Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Success Lab. And I am your host, uh, Dr. Arif Piarali, uh, on Success Lab, Lab powered by Learning Minds. And uh, today uh, we have another best selling author, and this time we have a very dynamic, very powerful personality. Uh, her name is Hira Ali. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Officer of Advancing Your Potential, Managing Director of International Women Empowerment uh, Events, Founding Director of Career Excel and the Co-Founder of the Gray Area. She is an Associate Certified Coach uh, accredited by International Coaching Federation and uh, a professional member of the Association of Neuro Linguistic Programming, also known as NLP. Uh, she has been featured in multiple uh, news channels, her career development broadcast of eight minute of learning with Hira Ali has been featured in HuffPost as one of the rising hundred podcasts with guests. Uh, her published book, uh, the, the book we would be talking about today is Her Way to the Top, A Guide to Smashing the Glass Ceiling. And all the female viewers uh, who uh, is listening to this particular uh, uh, episode, I would request that please share it with your uh, colleagues, your uh, the people you know in the corporate industry. And I'm sure Hera would be uh, sharing a lot of ideas and a lot of strategies uh, for how you can grow. And, and for the male audience, uh, this is a much watch as well because now what happens is that you can build up empathy uh, regarding that. So her way to the top has made it to the local newspapers such as Ham and High and international ones such as uh, Europe Breaking News. So without uh, further ado, let me welcome the guest for today, our best-selling author for this episode, uh, Miss Hira Ali. Hey, Hira. Hi, Arif. Thank you for having me over. It's a pleasure to be here. Our pleasure is all ours and thank you for accepting our invitation for being on Success Lab. And uh, uh, while I was going through your entire LinkedIn profile, uh, I had to catch breath for a multiple uh, times because the, 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 uh, the achievements are, um, are it's, it's humbling, it's, it's, it's remarkable and uh, it's, it, it gave me a a lot of motivation that I have just started. Uh, there's a long, long way to go uh, in my career as, as a consultant and a trainer. So uh, without, uh, without any, any further ado, let's, let's start with this interview and the concept of, uh, you showed me your book, uh, Her Way to the Top. I love the color, uh, which uh, the paperback color. Which sure, I, okay. yeah, yeah, please do so. So that's the book, guys. Uh, I love the, the color of the book. So Hira, my, my first question is, like, uh, there are so many ideas uh, author can have, uh, so many titles can author can uh, like pick from or can say that this should be the one. What inspired you or what's the background of her way to the top? Why you wanted that particular uh, theme to uh, to maybe co-align with your being what's what's the background story about that yes so the background is very relevant because i as you know i'm originally from pakistan and i started my career in pakistan and i started working as an hr manager junior hr manager and then i progressed to various roles and i was working in learning and development and that was the first time i developed women leadership program this was around 14 years back uh, it was International Women's Day, and I realized that they, you know, most of the trainings had mostly men, right? Um, and I used to do a lot of trainings. But we didn't have anything specifically for women, and that's when I came up with a program called Ru Avza, uh, which, you know, is a popular drink in Pakistan, and it was called, um, you know, the translation was Revitalize Your Soul. Uh, and okay. that was specifically okay. aimed at women because a lot of the, even though um, you know, I, was, I was working for Gets Farmer, which is a very progressive organization to date, mm. it's, it's, mm. yes. I really um, enjoyed being there. But of course, you know, 14 years, you know, 10 years back or 14 years back in companies like Mullen and Pips and Gets Farmer, it was a male dominated culture, 
we had a lot of women there, but there weren't any programs specifically for women. Most of the tournaments, most of the musical concerts, most of the recreation facilities were all aimed at men. So I said, I'm going to do something for women. And I created this program. The program became very popular. I used to get requests to do this program twice a year, uh, thrice a year. And um, yeah, so that's when I started getting like, you know, an insight into the lives of working women, women who were juggling their careers and sort of roadblock blocks they experience. Um, and I used to think that a lot of roadblocks have to do with the culture, because obviously we are in an Asian country and, you know, the, the background is different. It's not very uh, easy for women to progress uh, and get to the top. So I said, well, it's probably to do with that. And then I moved to Dubai because God, I got married. My husband moved to Dubai. So I moved to Dubai. Um, and there I was there for seven years. And in Dubai, uh, I was I continued to do these trainings. Uh, the only thing different was at this time, I was training women, but 85% were expats. So I was also training women from UK, Europe, and different countries. And again, mm. I saw a same trend in the roadblocks uh, you know, that women were experiencing in their career. And again, I thought that, you know, maybe this is because it's Dubai and Dubai is, you know, UAE is a Muslim country. So, of course, where you live does have an impact on the roadblocks you face. So I said, well, you know, this is Asia and Middle East, um, so probably the same thing. And then I moved to London four years ago. Um, and I was very excited because I thought I'd move into this really progressive city. Um, and again, I moved because my husband moved. <laughs> so I moved with him. And... Um, yeah, I mean, I thought that, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a place where women are going to be breaking glass ceilings and it's going to be amazing. Um, and to an extent, it is true, of course, comparatively, you know, the gender gap and progression is, is definitely way above uh, as compared to the South Asian countries here in London. But uh, the first week that I moved in, I saw a women's march and I was like, what are they marching for? And it uh, turns out that they were marching for the, the gender pay gap and lots of other discriminations and biases which they face, face regularly at work and then I realized oh my god this is not just an Asian Middle Eastern problem this is a universal problem mm. and I would say that sort of gave me um, I shouldn't say this but you know you have this perverse sort of delight in knowing that you're not alone and it's not just women from your country but globally you know we're in this together mm. so I decided to conduct uh, a survey and I said I'm going to test this theory because so far, this was my experience and my assumption. So I tested the theory and I did a survey on 300 women professionally across the globe from countries like Africa and Canada and Australia and, you know, Asia. And 300 women responded and I got, the answers were very, very similar. So what was identified were there were a set of internal and external challenges. And external mm -hmm. challenges were, of course, misogynist work environments, male-dominated industries which do not let women progress. Then there were lack of infrastructure and support because you know we live in a world which is designed primarily for men especially the organization culture um and of course third was sexual harassment so these were the external challenges and internal challenges were more to do with the internal roadblocks which women experience as a result of social conditioning you know imposter syndrome and um here's the point i would like to make that this book is not just relevant for women because a lot of the strategies i discuss in this book are equally relevant to men um a lot of men have read it, Asian men have read it, white men have read it, and they have found it mm. very useful, not just um, because the, the strategy is relevant to them, but also because it helped them in understanding the problems which their female colleagues experience. Yeah. So I would definitely yeah. recommend men to read this too. Um, and yes, after the, the survey, um, you know, I, can, I, I compiled the results, I sort of, you know, wrote a book, I did some research, I did lots of research, I'm a huge fan of research and surveys, I don't like to write any articles or do anything without research, so I did that, um, and, and the book came out her way to the top, the original title was The Glass Ceiling is Thicker Than It Looks, which was changed by my publisher, because uh, the book is actually, if you read the book, if you get a chance, um, it's, it's a very positive book, it talks about you know, the roadblocks we have, but what are the strategies which can be implemented? And of course, in mm. South Asia and Pakistan particularly, uh, the external challenges are much more than the internal challenges. So what is fascinating, the most fascinating part of the research was that Pakistani women and South Asian women do not face internal challenges as much um, as external challenges. So mm. they don't have confidence <clears throat> issues, they're already very confident. Uh, but their main issue is, you know, the lack of infrastructure, the social conditioning, the deep-rooted problems which exist in the society. So that was the problem. But yeah, that's the background of the book. That's how it came to be. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you for, for letting. And, and I am sure this, this particular interview would be very in-depth uh, because as, as a male interviewing on someone uh, which even I feel that there is a dire need of people to understand and not only females, even someone from an opposite gender need to empathize. Uh, I know the rally you are talking about, there was this pink tax and, and, and a lot of uh, fuss happened around that. So we won't get into the politics of that particular thing. Uh, but if, if I ask you another question relevant and pertinent to this particular book you have written uh, on two layers that uh, because COVID happened and economic meltdown yes. happened, a lot of people uh, lost their jobs and it was total chaos for the good four or five months uh, and it's still surviving, it's still going on, it hasn't ended yet. So uh, the, the point I'm trying to uh, ask you, the question I'm trying to ask you that uh, in the new normal uh, pertinent to your book, what a female can do or extract out of your book to get into the corporate industry again uh, in the thriving manner? And what as a male, uh, if they, they, they read your book or, or get some extracts from your book, what they can do or they can learn from that? So if you would be able to shed some light on yes. that. Absolutely. So um, Arif, here is a very interesting thing which I discovered while doing research my book was and that was when I wrote the book and the first person I handed my book over to was my husband and I said, well, here's the book, I've written it and now I think I am now going to focus because I also uh, do a lot of work around ethnic minorities here, you know, Asians, Blacks and ethnic minorities here in UK. So I said, you know, I think I'm going to now write, write a book on this. So when he read the challenges and he said, well, you know, some of these challenges are equally relevant to men and he said, I experienced them too. And I was very fascinated. I was like, do you? Um, and he was like, yes, I can relate to a lot of these challenges. Um, and then I started reaching out to, you know, patient, family, friends, because, because what happens is that things like imposter syndrome, am I good enough? They really impact you when you are in minority. So you could be in minority owing to your background, uh, socioeconomic background. It could be due to your culture, to your preferences, your, your, your religion, your um, your race, or it could be owing to your gender. So whatever makes you a minority in the room, in an organization, mm -hmm. that's what leads to specific internal challenges, whether you are a man or a woman. And interestingly, men would also be interested in knowing this, that imposter syndrome is said to be something which affects women uh, more, yes, but there are about seven different uh, categories. And one of the category is that if you are working in a creative field where you're as good as your last project, then that's where imposter syndrome can affect men too equally. So a lot of the strategies in the book um, that I have described are to do with, of course, imposter syndrome and how to deal with imposter syndrome. Um, and the, some of the other things which I have described are minority stress and you know things like that. Now, post-COVID, what will happen is because post-COVID, we have been hit by a recession. We are going to be hit by a second recession. So in a, in a, in a recent webinar I discussed, it's going to be very challenging for um, you know Generation Z. Uh, it was mm. challenging <laughs> for millennials, like my generation, Generation Y, because we have seen one recession. But now Generation Z has seen two recessions, um, and the market is going to be tight. That you know, one out of six millennials have lost their jobs. So it's going to be really difficult for them. And when uh, such difficult circumstances arise, you really need to be very good at, at building your leadership brand and not just building it, but communicating it to the market. You should be good at overcoming imposter syndrome because imposter syndrome hits hard, whether you're a man or a woman, when the circumstances are unusual or difficult. And you feel, oh my God, you know, the market is so bad. Will I ever get a job? Am I good enough? Who's going to hire me? Why me? There's so many good people out there. So this is what is, you know, this is the basis of imposter syndrome. So mm. post COVID, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, the strategies on imposter syndrome, the strategies on self-promotion, and the strategies on uh, managing stress. Because surviving and thriving post-COVID, the mental health is going to really impact Our mental health will be really, really impacted negatively. Um, so we, re so a lot of the strategies I provide in that are um, sort of very re relevant to, to both men and women. And women particularly have been impacted post-COVID. I've written lots of articles on this. I've been writing you know, in the last four months. Uh, I've been published 45 times and all oh, that I've written wow. is based on you know, how COVID has impacted um, you know, women and ethnic minorities. Unfortunately, especially in South Asia and you know, in countries like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, 
most of the homework is, is assigned to women. It's a women's, it's a very gendered society. So women are supposed to take care of the children, women are supposed to take care of the household chores. Uh, and there's no equal division of, of uh, you know, workload at home. And because of that post-COVID, even though both men and women have been working from home, even the working women have had to do like so much extra with, with no help yes. around. Um, and there's a research which has actually evidenced that, uh, I think it was, H yes, it is HBR, which showed that women's productivity has actually declined because they were, redu they were producing less research papers. They are so sort of, you know, engulfed in work, household chores and domestic responsibilities. And then there is a case of domestic violence. Um, so, of course, a lot of factors which negatively impact women. Um, so, in this book, you know, I talk about imposter syndrome and I talk about, uh, if you talk about, I'm sorry, did you ask me about, about discussing a specific strategy or did you say like what exactly were the topics in the book? That that would be our next question. Next. That would okay, be our yeah. Next so, question. so, I think the, the main things in this book, hmm. uh, which, which would be very relevant for COVID, would be getting over imposter syndrome time poverty because if you know we all are suffering from time poverty especially women so what are the, uh, the tips which they what are the strategies which they can undertake in order to sort of um, address this this time poverty issue managing stress uh, harassment and bullying so if you're a victim of harassment and bullying what should you do what are the steps you should take and then of course uh, things around vulnerability is it a good time to be vulnerable so all these strategies i would say uh, would be very equally relevant and some of them will be more relevant post-COVID um, mm. and I think I'm sure even for I'm men sure. to be and, and in an alignment with because because we are on this topic and I, I I must say that you have just hit the nail on the head because uh, these are the burning issues uh, I I was recently seeing this conference uh, international HR summit Expo if I'm not wrong uh, Middle East Expo and uh, we uh, there was this author who was talking about that females overall their their uh, the, their sense of responsibility have skyrocketed, uh, especially yes. for a subcontinent, because they need to look after the parents, the uh, uh, her husband, yes, the children. Elderly, yes. Exactly. Yes. So, so, so there is an entire uh, scope they they, they need they, they have to be responsible for, and at the same time, they uh, if they are a working woman, it just gets more difficult for them to manage time uh, on so Absolutely. many levels. So, because we are on this particular topic, and this is one of the burning issues, can you share some strategies? Uh, some extracts from your book, especially uh, some tips or techniques uh, for females uh, where they can actually boost their morale up in these uncertain times. And, and on this particular note, can you share uh, some uh, pointers for male of how they can, like how they can support, empathize or uh, work uh, with females in this uncertain times? Um, so basically, of course, one of the major reasons why women have been so uh, terribly impacted right now is um, a domestic violence has been on the rise. So I think that's one thing which really needs to be addressed because when you're sitting at home and you're in lockdown and you know how it is, uh, if men lose their temper, then these poor women have nowhere to go. That's really um, so sad, but that's, that's true. That's really sad. So of course, that's one thing which we need to pay attention to. Restoring our temper, restoring our you know, making sure that the women in our circle are safe. So if you feel your circle, your family, friends, not safe, you know, one way is to reach out to them and, you know, give them that support and tell them that, uh, give them helplines or, or sort of uh, resources which they can resort to in, in case they are a victim of domestic violence. And the other important thing is that if they are experiencing time poverty, honestly, what men can do is, is to step up and share the load. Um, you know, and thankfully, I'm married to a feminist husband uh, who's extremely supportive. And I will say this openly that, you know, if he if his help was in there at home, uh, a lot of times I wouldn't be able to take up a lot of work that I do right now. So I think partnership, equal partnership is important, right? <laughs> so I think equal partnership is really important. So even if you do not know how to do household chores, like, you know, maybe just the basic stuff, which you can help your where you, you know, you're, you're not only just your wives, but your mothers, your sisters, your daughters, with that would really go a long way. And, um, you know, just like 
small steps is, is what it takes. You don't have to like cook a lavish meal one day. Well, I hope you one day you can do that too. Uh, but just little steps in which you can say that, you know, I'm going to do this for you. You go and take a break. You, you sort of, you know, do your own work and I'm going to take it, take it from here. So this equal partnership is really important in countries like Pakistan. And I know it's difficult to achieve because it's, it's a very cultural thing. You know, men don't go into the kitchen. Men don't hold vacuum cleaners. But I have no shame. My nine-year-old boy, boy, you know, son, uh, last week uh, took a vacuum cleaner and he was vacuuming the floor. And, I, and I'm okay with it because I want my son to be raised in a way in which when he grows up and when he gets married, inshallah, one day, he's able to support his partner. So I think these things are really, really important just to sort of set up, step up and help. Just, just to add on to this, uh, one day I tried to make, uh, make dinner for my wife. Uh, just because uh, she was tired, uh, nobody ate that. We had to bring in pizza, uh, <laughs> but I tried. It's the intention yes, that counts. It's the intention that can, and to be honest, you know, if it's not just the food, it's just like my, you know, my husband and son, they have like a monster fight on the bed before they make it on Sunday, which is absolutely mm -hmm. fine about it. So I think women also need to, this is a tip for women. They need to let go of gatekeeping because women are gatekeepers. They're perfectionists. They want everything in their house to be done according to specific standards. So they're very quality oriented and that's why they don't like delegating. But I would suggest to women is please, please, please delegate chores. Give chores to your husband, to your children, whoever lives in the house, divide it equally so that your life is much easier because we tend to hold on to things. We say, oh, this kitchen is my area or, you know, cleaning is my area. So, but times have changed. If you don't do that, you will, you know, get burnt out in the long run. So delegate and don't worry if it's not being done perfectly. Just encourage them to do it and eventually they'll get better. Ooh, and the true. tips for men, you said, um, you, you, you said men, how men could step like up. How, right? so yeah, how, how they can empathize. Exactly. So I think this, this is exactly what they need to do. They need to realize, and, and I think the gender gap in Pakistan uh, Arif, is huge. Pakistan is one of the countries which is lowest and it pains my heart. Because we have amazing, empowered women in Pakistan who are creating waves in, globally. So then why is the gender gap so low? And of course, it takes into account a lot of things, you know, economic empowerment, political empowerment. Uh, but the least we can do is sort of understand uh, and be there for them, be a, like a role male ally. And I have uh, an article on the role of male allies and what they can do, small steps which I can share. And you can put it in, probably in the in the notes. Uh, but, the, but there are lots of little tiny steps which can help women in their day-to-day -day life. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, what I'll do is the time we publish this video uh, in the in the footnote or, or in the caption, I would be mentioning that particular link. Uh, so even the male or, or the audience who are listening to us, they can go there and see how they can be an ally uh, to someone uh, from a different, to, from, from another gender and help them out. Uh, if not help, if the if the word if the word help is not relevant, uh, maybe support, uh, yes. or or for that matter, just be there uh, for them as a, as another human being. Uh, because yes. right now we need to be very selective with our words as well, uh, because all of this uh, feministic movement. Uh, so just be there for them as humans. So, yeah. so my the feminist movement is not really asking for anything. <laughs> I know, I know. I, mean, I, I know. I'm, I'm just being diplomatically correct uh, on, on if, if, if we are asking another gender to be there for some, uh, for, for another gender. I'm just uh, wanted to be diplomatically correct uh, for that particular part. Okay, so that comes on to our last question of this particular interview. That if so, if an organization uh, wants to implement your ideas, your wisdom uh, into their culture, right, into their strategy, uh, into their employee development, human potential, uh, what advice would you give them? Like, what can they do to start off? Uh, I would highly recommend them to buy your book and read it thoroughly. Uh, but as coming from an author, what would you advise them? Um, so I'm now in the process of writing my second book and it's called oh, Her nice. Allies. So okay. Her Allies is all about uh, the role of government policies, the role of organization policies, the role of male allies and the role of media in supporting a woman's client with specific strategies. And this book is going to be 
aimed for men specifically. You know, you read and you say, what exactly can you do to help women? And these are literally small steps. You don't have to, uh, you know, do something dramatic uh, in the beginning, even though you're welcome to do it in the future, but you just start with small steps. Uh, but yes, I think in the beginning, all you need to do is sort of make sure that your recruitment and training policies and the entire organization structure is not just uh, something which, is, which has been created and designed keeping men in mind. Working women, particularly working moms, find it very tough to get back to work. So what are the policies that are creating in order to encourage these women to come back to work after they have left for a break? Mm. And, you know, so pro-women policies, um, you know, go over your, of course, this, you know, this is a consultancy project. And of course, if you're willing, if you want to, I would love to sort of help your organization in, in, in getting those strategies in place. Uh, but just have a review of all your policies and, and make sure that you now look at them with a the new light in your eyes. How can you support women? And COVID-19 has already proved that you can work from home for a, for a long period. So that yeah. really improves yeah. the chances for women to work from home, especially young mothers who have young children who can't leave them, you know, new mothers sorry, who have young children who can't leave them behind. Um, so, you know, work from home opportunities, explore flexi timings, flexi options. If there are, if you can, I know Unilever back then um, had this, this or it was some other organization, I can't remember, but I think, Gets was also started this. Um, I need to. I need to. Under, I'm not sure. I need to uh, confirm. No, that's this. okay. That's okay. <laughs> On-site childcare facilities can really help hmm. mothers. So little things like that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so because we were talking about the COVID, uh, like I, I just read a particular joke around that. That if COVID was a person, and uh, if someone would read. Uh, the, uh, his or her resume, it would be more uh, distinguishable or, or more, they, they, it achieved more than a lot of CEOs in the world. Uh, so for example, the flexi timing or, or working from home, uh, uh, this, this tradition of working from home and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, so yeah, organization. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry for cutting you. That's, One that's thing I would really like to add is, that if you are working with a woman and you feel that, that there has been there have been microaggressions or anything which has made her feel harassed or discriminated, then do call that out. I think that is the biggest support you can do at this day mm. and time is to support a woman in your organization who's being unfairly treated or into her yeah. gender or is being harassed or into her gender. So I think that's another very important thing which yeah. organizations yeah. need to pay keep um, yeah. you know, pay, we, we need to be to. we need to make uh, that a particular part of the whistleblowing. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, normally, it's on the ethical grounds, but I think so. This should be an integral part of that as well, uh, especially for the subcontinent. Uh, for for that for the matter that we are your allies, uh, as per your next book, and I would love to have an, another interview on that particular book as well. Definitely. Uh, so so with that, uh, thank you so much, Hira. Thank you for spending our time. Thank you for uh, sharing your wisdom. Uh, with us and uh, I hope uh, and I request each and every one who is viewing this episode uh, who knows Hira or me to get uh, to get this book to read it up I would also be sharing an article of as, as Hira uh, would share me the link of it uh, for the male audience uh, or, or the male of who wants to be the allies of, of women in the workplace uh, so till the next time or for the next episode, I, Dr. Arif Parley, signing out with Success Lab, powered by Learning Minds. And with that, uh, lastly, I would like to thank our uh, uh, global best-selling author, Hira Ali. A uh, goodbye. Thank you. Care, thank Hira. you for having me. Bye. Thank you, Hira. Take care. You're most welcome.